You know, with all the problems in the world of the COVID-19, this coronavirus that's killing so many people and making so many people sick and has the entire world shut down, has got me thinking, you know, I, I don't want to talk about this pandemic for humans, but what I would like to talk about is another type of a pandemic with trees. Now, I've spoken many, many times in the past about what is often referred to as sudden oak death. It's Phytophthora remorum. And it is devastating, particularly one species of tree. It, it attacks a number of different types of trees, but it seems to me that the one species of tree that is, is just being decimated is the tan oak. So I wanted to go for a little walk out in my forest, my woods. I, I live on 20 acres up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And I have, I'm gonna guess I've probably got a thousand tan oaks on my property. It is probably the principal tree. You know, I've got a number of different species. I have, you know, quite a few madrones. I have, oh, probably 30 or 40 big fir trees. I have the black oak, which is not that dominant. I probably got maybe a hundred black oaks on the property. Oh, I almost forgot. We've got the canyon live oak. Canyon live oak, this is an exceptionally large specimen. It's about oh, five feet across at the base, but I want you to look up this tree. This is one of the most magnificent trees on my property. It is well over 120 feet tall. Just a magnificent tree. And an assortment of a few other species, but those are the primary trees. I don't have any redwoods on my property. I'm at an elevation of uh, 2,850 feet, and the redwoods actually grow a little bit lower. They're down in the elevations in the 1,800 to 2,200. That, that's their primary elevation in the Santa Cruz Mountains. But where I live, the tan oak, is, it's such an important tree, but it, it's kind of overlooked. I mean, it, it's not milled very much. I, I've heard that there are a few companies that are using tan oak for making some flooring, but as a lumber, it's, it's not a real prominent species. Uh, back in the early days, 1800s, the bark was peeled off the tan oak and it was used for tanning hides. And there was actually a business of people cutting down tan oak trees, stripping off the bark and selling the bark to the tanneries. And, and that was quite a, quite a big business back in its heyday. And then they came out with chemical tanning and all sorts of other tanning devices. And nowadays, you don't even get a whole lot of uh, leather production. Everything seems to be synthetic. So behind me are a number of very, very tall tan oak trees. I don't know how well you can see that, but these trees are all in excess of 100 feet tall. They grow very, very tight together. They seem to intersperse with a few other trees, but they seem to dominate whole areas of the forest. And of that thousand tan oak trees on my property, let me back up a little bit. I've lived on this property for almost 25 years. When I first moved to this property 25 years ago, I didn't see a single dead tan oak. About 15 years ago, when this outbreak started up, I found a few dead ones. And over the years, we have probably lost a third of all of our tan oaks and another 25 to 30 percent of them are either infected or dying. And when I say infected, I don't know what degree the healthy looking trees are infected. I'll give you a good example here. Here's a leaf. You see the tip of it, how it's dead? The leaves are green. Lots of areas on this particular tan oak show dead and then some green. So it's working its way back in. Oftentimes I'll see a tan oak that has a number of leaves that are completely dead, much like this one here, but it also has 
green leaves. Does that mean that this tree is struggling to survive or is it going to completely die? Well, if you look up into the canopy, you can see that it's barely alive, but the disease seems to be working itself in from the tips. And what I know about the disease is it is a waterborne fungus that seems to grow on the tips of the leaves and the spores go out, especially in the wetter season when there is water drops on the leaves. And other species of trees, such as the bay tree, are known to be, um, I hate to use the word carriers, but they seem to allow the spores to grow in the water droplets that collect on the bottoms of the leaves. So a lot of people are saying that the bay trees need to go. Get rid of the bay trees, save the oaks. Well, I've got mixed feelings about that too, because that seems like a really drastic measure for trying to resolve the situation. Maybe there is some truth to it. I really wonder sometimes, um, but science goes out and makes all these discoveries. And a lot of times it's the media or um, maybe a group of people that will say something and they will try it. And if they have good results, how do you document it and say, okay, that's because we got rid of the bay trees or maybe it was a better season. Then there's so many what ifs. And much like the human virus that people are going through. This is not a virus, this is a fungus, but it's spreading like a pandemic of, of the trees. So I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna do. If you look up behind me here, up behind, you can see a whole bunch of big dead tan oaks that have died and fallen down. Another thing to think about with these tan oaks is they are highly susceptible to the ambrosia beetle and other wood boring insects that quickly get into the tree and cause it to become very, very brittle. Also other forms of fungus will start attacking the tree and these trees seem to quickly dissolve. You know, I'm looking up at a big tree right here behind me. I don't know if you can see that one, but you look at the top of that and it is pretty much a goner. It's going away quickly. And I don't know if you can see the base of this tree, but you can see right behind me here how rotted this tree is. So this tree is definitely going to be the next one to go. It's looking up, I'd say it's got, uh, you know, some of the foliage still looks pretty good, but it's going to go away just based upon the, the, the rot at the, uh, the base of the tree. And this was actually caused by an injury. A tree fell down and hit the base of this tree. And because you can see some active cambium tissue growing up and around it. So I look out the forest and I really don't know what to do. You know, it's during a big windstorm, I'll go outside on my deck and listen out in the woods and I hear all kinds of creaking and crashing and, and trees falling down. Then I go for a hike the next time and sure enough, there's more trees on the ground. There's trees that are tangled up in other trees. I wanna show you something here behind me. This is gonna kind of blow your mind. Okay, I don't know how well you can see this, but if you look at the trunk of this tree right here and look up the trunk, you'll see all these big pocks and they go all the way up to the top. And if you look at this other tree over here, which is a completely dead one, it also is exhibiting these holes. This looks like some kind of a trunk canker and I'm not exactly sure what it is. It's probably related to the, you know, what we call the target canker. Um, but it's kind of rare. I don't find it too often. But what I wanted to show you is this tree has broken off at the base and it is leaning on this other dead tree. This dead tree over here, which is also another tan oak, has completely rotted and it has fallen and it is leaning on that tan oak right there, that tiny little spot. Right there, that little tiny tan oak is holding this whole mass up. So what I am standing on right now is a death zone. Fortunately, I am pretty able, and if I saw or heard the slightest little bit of movement, I'd be out of here like a jackrabbit. But this is an interesting situation. I, I want to resolve this. I want to get this down, because this is on one of my pathways that we like to, to walk. 
my wife and the dogs come out here frequently. So what I'm looking at is this tan oak right here is the one that's holding everything up. But the very tip top of it is being supported by a branch on that other madrone. It's kind of hard to see in this video, but way up there, this branch or this tree is leaning on that madrone and that is supporting both of those trees at that one point right there. So there's a number of things I could do. Um, probably the safest thing to do would be to wrap a chain around it, take the bobcat way back there and pull on it. Or I could probably pull on it from that direction and it'll probably jerk it enough to get things to go down. Um, I could also get rid of this tree and put a wedge in it right here and come back very carefully, but there's an awful lot of pressure on that thing, so something's gonna give quickly. But if I do that, I have to be very wary because that tree over there is leaning in my direction. And if something falls, there's yet another dead tree right here and a lot of dead branches up there. So, hmm, this is one to think about. You know, a lot of people get hurt or even killed because they see a situation and they don't thoroughly think it through. They say, oh yeah, I'll cut that thing down. And they'll go in there, I'll just get started cutting and wham, bam, everything starts going crazy. And something either falls on them, it barber chairs. I mean, so much could happen with this situation. So what do I do? Hmm, I'm not sure. How would you handle this situation? All right, I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm not gonna do this right now, but uh, it's gonna rain in a bit anyway. There's one of my giant firs. I have a big Douglas fir down on the bottom of the property that is probably four to 500 years old. This one right here is about, believe it or not, when we cut them down, I always count the rings. I'd say this tree is about 160 years old, maybe 170. I think I'm a pretty close guess. And a lot of times a tree will grow much larger than another tree of the same species because of the amount of sunlight it gets. So there's a lot of other trees that were growing around this one, but these oaks in the back here are ever bit as old, maybe older, but there's not a lot of other big trees in this area. So I think that this tree got a good start on life as it was growing and it's probably a relatively fast-growing Douglas fir. Now here's something else kind of cool. There's another, it's a dead madrone right there. Excellent firewood. Oh, we got black oaks on the property, I said. And we've also got poison oak. This is an amazing poison oak vine. And it's going all the way up and it's completely taking out the whole top of that tree. What do I do about it? Well, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm just gonna leave it be. Poison oak is actually kind of pretty. Uh, it is part of the natural environment. It's just so long as you don't touch it, it's, uh, you know, live and let live and I leave it be. Here's a young tan oak. There's the tan oak leaves. Oh, there's another little death trap. This just fell down recently. That is a dead black oak that has bent over. That's interesting. I don't know how long that's been dead. Looks like firewood to me. There's another poison oak vine growing up and completely eating that black oak over there. Here's kind of an interesting bit of trivia here. I'm standing on a few of the logs that I've got destined for milling. These are mostly redwood logs. That one right there is a cedar. But I've got this fir tree right here. This is a Douglas fir. And when I first moved to this property, this was a tiny little tree. It was only about 10 inches in diameter. And I remember it really well because of course it's next to my driveway and I drive past it every single day. And uh, now it is about 20, two, maybe 24 inches across at the base and close to 70 feet tall. So this tree, I'm going to guess, let's see if it was say 10 inches in diameter when we moved in here, it was probably about 15 years old. 
So this tree is about 40 years old. That's how fast these trees grow. There's the only redwood that I've got on my property. And I planted this tree. I planted this tree the year we moved here, believe it or not. And it is really struggling. It's barely growing, but it's growing and it's doing okay. Um, this tree was an understory tree. It was growing underneath the canopy of a lot of shade. It didn't get a lot of sun. It never got any additional water. So this tree is about as naturalized a tree as you could hope for. Um, it was in a pot, so the pot was very likely uh, root bound somewhat. So that may be part of the reason that it grew slowly. But uh, I'm guessing that the tree was about seven or eight years old when I planted it. It now has a trunk diameter of about five inches. It's about 16 feet tall. And I know this tree is at least 30 years old. So there's a interesting contrast. And a lot of times the redwood trees in a native redwood forest grow this way. They'll be very, very slow growing until they get a foothold on life and get enough of an area to absorb enough sunlight so that the photosynthesis can do its job and the tree will take off. You know, there's two fir trees, one there and one there. I think I prefer the redwood. I've got a lot of firs that are competing in here. If I take those firs down, that might open up the light to this tree and it might grow a little bit faster. Maybe by the time I die, this tree will be 10 inches in diameter and 20 feet tall. <laughs> well, hope you enjoyed this little tour and stay safe out there. You know, we're not working right now. So I'm kind of looking for ideas for videos, but I do have a lot of work to do on my property. Stay safe.